Well, welcome to Lecture 6, Organisational Design. And this is a synopsis lecture. Uh, again, it's not the full lecture, and we're just covering some points that may be of interest to you. Uh, for study and reference purposes, you should refer to the full lecture. And again, I need to remind myself and remind you that we're supposed to be in, uh, enjoying this learning journey, learning about airline management. We're up to Organisational Design Lecture 6. And in this lecture, it'll mainly, well, it will be focused on organisational development. And then after that, we'll have a look at the learning points. So let's have a look at the lecture. Firstly, let's revisit lecture two. And we talked about in lecture two that what is an organisation, what defines it. And we said it's a deliberate arrangement of people to accomplish some specific purpose. So it has the distinct purpose, a deliberate structure, and people. And uh, this is what constitutes an organisation. And we said that managers are important to organisations for three reasons. Uh, their management skills and abilities. Uh, the, uh, they're critical for getting things done. And they also contribute to employees' productivity and loyalty. The way managers... Oh, sorry, the way employees are managed can affect the organisation's financial performance and managerial ability has been shown to be important in creating organisational value. So, talking about the importance of managers in the organisation, because that's what this course is about, is about being a manager. We talked about the fact that uh, managers are responsible for task performance and human resource management, and again, that long and sustainable work uh, outcomes or work performance. We talked about efficiency and effectiveness. In, uh, it's most important in organisations. And we said that if you plot it, performance efficiency against performance effectiveness, there's four general possibilities that you could fall in with uh, looking at those two axes. And some places uh, are uh, not very good to be. For instance, uh, poor and poor, neither efficient or effective. Where you need to be is efficient and effective uh, to get the maximum uh, returns for your organisation. So now let's look at the role of organisations now that we've laid uh, or uh, gone across that general background of, uh, of management and organisations. Organisations are collections of people working together, together in divisions of labour to achieve a common purpose. And simply they exist because individuals are limited in their physical and mental capabilities. I can't make a car on my own. Uh, and the most efficient and effective way to make a car is uh, to use the structure of an organisation. Some of the characteristics of an organisation is they produce goods and or services. They need a clear statement of purpose to guide activities. They use a division of labour to achieve outputs. So we allocate people to specific jobs, division of labour. A synergy, so putting it all together, a synergy is created where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And there's a need to manage human resources to serve their purpose, so you need uh, a very definite human resources aspect. And we use work teams, which are task-orientated groups, to achieve uh, some of the activities. In simple, very simple language, this is about uh, the organisational inputs. We have human resources, that's the handle. We put it into the grinder, with material resources such as raw materials, information, equipment, technology, facilities and finances. We turn the handle and we produce goods and or services. Very simple at, uh, at that level. Organising is arranging and structuring the work to accomplish the organisation's goals. And there's a large number of purposes of, uh, of organising. When managers develop or change an organisation structure, they are involved in organisational design. Jay Galbraith told us that when we're looking at organisational design, we need to look at strategy for the organisation, so it's vision, governance and comparative advantage. We need to look at structure, the power and authority, the information flow through the organisation and the organisation's rules, the business processes and lateral links, the networks, processes, teams, integrative roles, and the matrix structures, the reward systems, so compensation rewards, and human resource management, hiring, 
uh, work feedback, learning and development. So uh, strategy, structure, business processes and lateral links, reward systems and human resource management all tell us about how to design our organisation. He went on to talk about the fact that there's a number of steps that you need to follow. Uh, develop your strategy first, then you develop your structure. You need to understand what your key processes are, who your key people are, their roles and responsibilities. You need to understand what information systems you'll be using and you uh, need to define what the performance measures and rewards are. You need to understand uh, that uh, training and development will grow your organisations. That's a, a, a one point a lot of organisations forget about professional development or training and development as it's shown here, uh, that helps to grow your organisation and its capacity and also career paths of the staff. And Jay Galbraith said if you follow these organisational design steps, you in fact will have a very healthy organisational structure. There's a proven model of determining structure. So let's just talk about, not strategy, the next one along, structure. Uh, there's a proven model for that and it covers uh, these uh, topics work specialisation, departmentalisation, chain of command, span of control, centralisation and formalisation. So I'm just going to talk about each of those very, very quickly. Firstly, work specialisation is dividing tasks into separate jobs. So the jobs are broken down into small, simple and separate operations in which each worker specialise specialises. Job variety makes it possible for people to choose or be assigned to positions they will enjoy for which they are well suited. And it's an excellent productivity driver in a large workforce. Departmentalisation is where jobs are grouped to accomplish organisational goals. You can departmentalise by functions, by geographic location, by the product that you're producing by the processes that you're using or by uh, the customers that you're serving. So they're all ways of uh, looking at departmentalization and the various approaches you could use. Chain of command. Uh, we spoke about accountability, authority and responsibility before, but under chain of command, uh, under the organizational uh, design model for structure, it's about authority, the inherent right to give orders to others and expect them to be carried out. Responsibility, the obligation to perform duties assigned by a superior in the organisation who is in the direct line, the direct line of authority and unity of command. And one of the problems, in, uh, in especially in organic organisations in today's world, is often uh, with team-based approaches, someone may be working to multiple bosses. And this can cause conflict of expectations from all the various bosses on the individual who has to carry them out. And that's called unity of command, that one person should understand who he's ultimately accountable, ultimately accountable to on a day-to-day -day basis. Span of control, the number of subordinates a manager can direct. And it's uh, proven over, over years and by scientific studies that three direct reports is the optimum number of, of people to handle, but up to five uh, can be handled in a focused team arrangement. There's a trend in modern organisations, uh, and I'm thinking of Qantas' organisation at one stage, where the CEO had about 15 direct reports to him. And again, under the span of control, the, the uh, determining structure model of a span of control, this is much too broad. Uh, but uh, in a more contemporary world, this is happening more and more. Uh, centralisation, uh, you can have centralisation where all the decisions come in to the upper levels of the organisation, or decentralisation, where the decisions are sent out to the staff to make on behalf of the organisation. And sometimes decentralisation is important because of location. Uh, an airline, for example, might have you know, 10 or 15 or so different locations where the airline operates from, and they need for decisions to be made in each of those locations, so a more decentralised model. But when it comes to, to the large financial decisions, it's centralised. It needs to be made back at the headquarters level. There's also the, what they call the parity principle when it comes to, um, to uh, determining structure. And I spoke in part about this before, when responsibility is delegated, sufficient authority and resources must also be allocated. So if you're told, 
uh, if you're told uh, to, uh, this is your task to get on with it, as I mentioned earlier, and you, give, you aren't given the resources to it, well, you really haven't been tasked. Uh, so you need to say, hey, where are my resources? Formalisation, and this is the degree to which jobs, uh, or to which an organisation relies on rules and procedures. And there's high formalisation where the staff are highly controlled through policies and procedures, and low formalisation where staff are allowed to initiate to achieve outcomes. And you may remember from Bethune with, uh, when he was looking at uh, revitalising Continental Airlines, they at the time when he took over the airline had high formalisation. Staff weren't allowed to make any decisions. It was a centralised system, everything had to go to the top, uh, or the staff were fully you know, in the sense of formalisation. The staff had, had very detailed procedures that they had to follow and they weren't allowed to show <coughs> any initiative themselves to make decisions. And he changed it into a low formalisation model where staff were allowed to show initiative to achieve the organisation's outcomes. So that's the determining structure model for organisational design, work specialisation, departmentalisation, chain of command, span of control, centralisation and formalisation. Let's have a look at organisations, what they might look like. Uh, there's me mechanistic organisations, uh, from that perspective, the, the traditional wiring diagram approach, uh, whereby you have a CEO, various people uh, being responsible for him, and then under that CEO, uh, under those individuals, all sorts of uh, different areas reporting back to them. So they're called mechanistic organisations. A more contemporary form uh, and used by people like Google, for example. Uh, there's some really good YouTube clips on Google and how it structures itself, where there's cross-functional teams, there's cross-hierarchical teams, there's a free flow of information, there's wide spans of control, there's decentralised decision-making and low formalisation. And they are called organic organisations. So I guess the question to ask yourself is whether an airline should uh, be mechanistic or organic. And uh, the reality is, is uh, airlines are better suited in most cases to be mechanistic uh, rather than organic. Uh, for example, uh, in organic structures, you might give your staff uh, control over what time they come to the office and what time they leave. Uh, in an airline sense, uh, you need people there when the aircraft arrives and to see the aircraft off. So from that perspective, you need a more formalised approach and a more mechanistic organisation. Some of the contingency variables about organisational design, and contingency just means depending on the situation, it's about strategy, size, technology and environmental uncertainty. So basically, strategy and structure first, strategy and structure closely linked, structure follows strategy. It's a really important point to, for people to understand. Often an organisation changes its strategy, but it doesn't change its structure. But structure always follows strategy. So when the strategy has been amended, the structure should also be changed to meet the changed circumstances. And there's three generic models for the strategy structure relationship. And there's innovation, pursuit of new goods and services, cost minimisation, and imitation. And what you see uh, with uh, Southwest Airlines as a low cost carrier, the first low cost carrier in the world, a lot of people imitated uh, uh, Southwest Airlines. Cost minimization model, a lot of people follow the cost minimization, they try and be the lowest cost producer uh, uh, in the market, and there's other organisations that pursue innovation. What happens? Sometimes people take a mix of these, and a good example is AirAsia. AirAsia has imitated Southwest Airlines' uh, low-cost carrier model, but it's doing it using cost minimisation as a basis. AirAsia provides airline seats at the lowest price in the world, based purely on uh, cost minimisation. Let's uh, talk about structure. Uh, size and structure, sorry, size and structure. There's considerable evidence that an organisation's size affects its structure. The larger the organisation, the more specialisation you need. And the relationship isn't linear. If you've got a small organisation, you may to, might need to have some specialisations in it. And as you grow, they don't need to grow because you have them. So, so uh, relationships uh, change as organisations grow or shrink. And 
some new entrants into some businesses like the airline industry, it's quite a high cost to come into the airline industry because your initial high workforce overheads are quite large due to the broad re uh, range of specialisations that are required, regardless of whether you're small or whether you're large. Technology and structure. Technology will influence structure. It's a great enabler in converting inputs to outputs. Uh, and the effect on structure will depend on the level of technology, uh, te technological complexity and sophistication. So if you have a look at the, uh, the 747 here and the DC-3 at Qantas, obviously very different organisations are required to run those aircraft types. And there's some studies that indicate that unit production, that is production of items in small batches, will have a minimal effect on structure. Mass production will greatly affect uh, structure and process production uh, oil industry, for example, uh, steel mills, uh, the printing industry, where it's continuous process production, will more than likely dictate the structure of an organisation. And that's what happens in, in uh, airlines. It's a process production business. There's also environmental uncertainty. And if an organisation uh, lives in an uncertain environment, it'll tend to have a more flexible uh, structure that it can quickly adapt to changing circumstances circumstances and if it's living in a more certain environment it'll have a more static structure uh, it'll it'll be uh, it'll be operating from day to day with a more more uh, more uh, hierarchical uh, mechanistic structure to deal with its day-to-day -day business generally the nature of the airline business requires airlines to be structured under formal lines of responsibility and the number of layers within the structure depends very much on the nature size and complexity of the organization some of the generic business models for airlines that we talk about are network airlines, uh, and some older texts still refer to them as legacy carriers, regional airlines, low-cost carriers, and charter airlines, each with specific purposes. During the full lecture, I then go into quite a long case study on Air Asia and uh, bring out some of the teaching points about organizational design. Some of the learning points from this discussion uh, uh, shown here and here. So what have I covered? Uh, organisational design, or uh, I've used development here, organisational design is a most important aspect. If you get it wrong, the organisation won't have the efficiency and, effective you need, efficiency and effectiveness you need to achieve the performance outcomes that you want. You can't get it wrong. It's a very, very a specialist area for people to work in and sometimes you may need to in fact hire specialists in uh, either short term or long term to help uh, with uh, an organisation. So hopefully uh, the learning points will bring out some of those uh, salient points that were covered in the synopsis lecture. If you want to do some pre-reading uh, in the text next week we look at human resources and industrial relations. So that brings to an end lecture six, organisational design. I hope you've enjoyed uh, this synopsis lecture and I look forward to the next one. Thank you.